I would like to start by welcoming everyone. My name is Dr. Amy Krupel, and I'm the director of the Center for European Studies. The UF Center for European Studies is a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, as well as a Title VI National Resource Center for Europe. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Today's discussion will be recorded and available on the UF CES website, and we will have a Q&A session following the presentation. Participants can submit questions through the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. I want to thank everyone for joining us today to discuss the Ottoman Greeks of the United States Project, or OGUS, O-G-U-S. This talk is part of our Lunchtime Symposium speaker series. CES hosts three to four Lunchtime Symposiums each semester for faculty and advanced graduate students to present current research on Europe from any discipline. If you have a European topic you'd like to present, please do contact us. You can uh, reach out to Carla Ruffer at rufferc at ufl.edu and you can find this information on our website. Our speaker today is George Topolaitis. George holds his degrees from Southern Connecticut State University in History and from the University of Connecticut in Microbiology. He is currently a PhD candidate in the fourth year of his studies at the Department of Sociology and Criminology and Law. His research interests are framed within the field of historical sociology and include racial identity construction and contestation, US immigration law and social memory. He is the founder and project coordinator of the Ottoman Greeks of the United States Project at the University of Florida's Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. We're very fortunate today to have moderating our Q&A session, Dr. Chris Kostopoulos, who is a faculty member with CES and Classics. Dr. Kostopoulos' interests vary from Roman and ancient Greek science, astrology in particular, to modern Greek linguistics, history, and politics. And with no further ado, I'd like to hand the discussion over to George. Please remember at the end of the talk, when you leave, that there is an event survey, which participants will be taken to. We very much appreciate your participation in the survey as it helps us learn more about how to provide interesting talks and uh, programs for you. So, George? Hi, everyone. I'd like to first begin by uh, thanking the Center for European Studies uh, for its support today and uh, providing me this time uh, to present to you the uh, different components of the Ottoman Greeks of the US project, uh, which is uh, housed by the Samuel Proctor Old History Program. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by briefly providing just a little bit more information about myself, which I believe uh, you know, is pertinent to, pertinent to the project itself. Um, I think that um, very much so I, I am uh, interconnected with this project because of my background. Uh, it is a passion of mine because of uh, the fact that my own parents uh, were uh, second generation immigrants to Greece, uh, students, uh, um, uh, excuse me, immigrant uh, <laughs> descendants uh, of immigrants from the former Ottoman Empire, specifically from the northeastern part of uh, the uh, former Ottoman Empire in the Black Sea. I was born in Greece and myself, I'm a first generation immigrant to the United States. Um, and very often, um, as you'll see, as we go through the, the different components of this project, very often uh, I identify myself with uh, the individuals who so graciously donate their time, uh, their artifacts, uh, their histories uh, from their parents and grandparents and ancestors uh, to, the, to the Ogus project. Um, I heard very similar stories to, their, to theirs when I was a child. Uh, my parents uh, often told me about uh, their parents' experiences, uh, what they lived through uh, as, Im as uh, you know, uh, citizens of the Ottoman Empire, as immigrants to, the, to Greece, um, and uh, ultimately the political and historical events uh, that impacted their lives. Uh, so these were taught to me from a very young generation, from a very young age, um, and you know, I hold them dear to my heart. Um, and uh, they are the impetus in many ways uh, for me pursuing this project and establishing it um, with the help of the, the wonderful staff at the Samuel Proctor Old History Program. Uh, everything that you'll see today did not exist uh, five years ago. It was just a thought, uh, you know, in the back of my mind as to what to do with the uh, uh, information that I found uh, during my master's uh, studies at Southern Connecticut State University uh, under the guidance of Dr. Virginia Metexas. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Nicola was Crisidis. Um, and thanks to them, I was able to uh, kind of gather all of these materials that you're gonna see here, 
um, and uh, ultimately was able to put all of these materials into uh, uh, an organizational um, structure uh, so that they would be ultimately available to the broader public. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with no further ado, uh, I'd like to begin by um, introducing you to our website, uh, the uh, Autumn Greeks of the United States Projects website. Um, this, this is the platform really for all of the, the links and uh, materials needed uh, to access the collections uh, that the uh, OGUS project, the Autumn Greeks of the US project uh, holds. And uh, what I'd like to do is kind of introduce you to each of the components. So uh, to begin, uh, what we what the uh, Autumn Greeks of the US project contains uh, are really four uh, areas of uh, uh, artifacts uh, and research, uh, in essence. So uh, the first and foremost are the interviews uh, with descendants of immigrants from the former Ottoman Empire to the United States uh, during the early 20th century. Um, these interviews are, are were donated uh, by the respondents, um, and uh, they uh, contain information about uh, the lives of their ancestors in the former Ottoman Empire, uh, the um, uh, circumstances under which uh, they immigrated or were expelled uh, from the former Ottoman Empire, and uh, their migration paths, uh, where they stopped uh, along the way, and ultimately when they arrived to the U.S., uh, their lives here in the United States. Uh, so currently, the uh, project uh, holds over 200 interviews, um, and uh, the interviewing process is ongoing, so we're uh, collecting more interviews and um, all of those interviews, of course, will be uh, housed in uh, the Uni University of Florida's uh, library's digital collections. In addition to the interviews, we have two dimensional artifacts. And uh, I'd like to show you just a couple of examples here um, of two dimensional artifacts. Uh, first, there are documents uh, such as this one. <clears throat> uh, these documents uh, include uh, anything and everything from uh, letters, uh, correspondence uh, between family members that lived in the former Ottoman Empire and the United States uh, in the early 20th century, uh, short biographical statements, um, uh, as well as uh, memorials, uh, postcards with writing on them. Uh, and uh, these are in different uh, uh, languages, uh, inclusive of, Gre of modern Greek, uh, of um, Turkish uh, Ottoman script in some cases, and also in Karaman Lidika, uh, which is a uh, form of, um, uh, it's, a, it's a script basically utilizing Greek script, but um, writing the Turkish language. Uh, so we have a variety uh, of items in, in, the, in the documents uh, that we see in the two-dimensional uh, artifacts. This example comes to us from uh, Ms. Avanthia Gatsinaris. This is a, a certificate of membership uh, to an organization that was set up in um, uh, this particular branch, set up in Constantinople at the time uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, this is a branch of an organization of a mutual aid society uh, that uh, consisted of members from uh, the island of Marmara, which is in the Sea of Marmara um, in uh, north uh, western uh, Turkey. So the Bosporus between uh, between uh, the European and Asiatic side of Turkey. Um, and, uh, you know, th this organization actually had branches throughout the United States uh, as well. Um, and we found evidence uh, for uh, members of this organization utilizing the uh, org the uh, the different networks that this organization had in the US uh, as a means of gaining access to different cities in the United States and, and um, immigrating there. Uh, so this is a certificate of that organization. Another example uh, was provided to us by uh, Mr. Nick Nicholas Spondel. This is his grandfather uh, who was um, here dressed in um, traditional guerrilla warfare garb uh, there was uh, there is evidence and historical record of a, a guerrilla war occurring in uh, northeastern Turkey uh, in the early 20th century between the years of 1918-1922, uh, um, and uh, uh, Mr. Spondel provided us this photograph uh, of his grandfather, uh, you know, in rifle and uh, uh, guerrilla garb. Uh, another. Uh, 
interesting artifact, uh, two-dimensional that I'd like to uh, show you. Uh, Kainal has a, a story behind it. This is a, uh, a donation from one of our respondents, uh, actually very close to the University of Florida in Gainesville. Um, this gentleman uh, was interviewed and after the interview was complete, uh, called me and said, uh, George, you know, you forgot your charger here at my home. Uh, you need to come back and, uh, you know, get your charger. Oh, and by the way, he, he said, I have something to show you. Um, you know, there's this uh, vase I have in my closet that I've kept uh, for years. I don't really know what it says, uh, he said, but, um, you know, maybe you can look at it and make something of it. He goes, he says, you know, my uh, grand uncle uh, gave it to me. Um, and it turned out that his grand uncle was actually a, uh, a, uh, a member, a troop, an officer uh, in the Ottoman army uh, who defected uh, from the Ottoman army. Um, he was actually very skilled uh, artistically and uh, he actually, he has, uh, the respondent has uh, different artifacts in his possession from his grand uncle, uh, some of which are uh, um, works of art and this, uh, this uh, vase. Uh, so this is about a, a foot tall uh, by maybe three, four inches in diameter. I have the exact measurements. And, you know, when I first looked at it, he, he said to me, well, you know, I use this for my umbrellas. You know, I put my umbrellas in there because I don't really know what it is. But, uh, you know, uh, maybe maybe if you see it, you could tell me more. And if you look carefully here, what's uh, this is all, um, by the way, this is all carved, hand carved um, using uh, a hammer and <clears throat> a hammer and pistol. And you can actually see all the marks from that pistol that the, that the hammer made. So this is handmade. Um, and you know, we, we have good reason to believe his, his grand uncle actually made it by hand. What it says across here is the word Sangarios. And uh, Sangarios was, one of, was the, the river where one of the major battles between uh, the Ottoman uh, Turkish uh, army and uh, the Greek army uh, occurred in 1921. Um, and uh, in, that, in that battle, uh, the Turkish troops uh, were pushed back uh, and they, they held their ground uh, across that, that riverbank um, you know, for the duration of, uh, of the rest of the, of the war, um, uh, the Greco-Turkish War. Uh, so he had this in his possession, didn't really know what it meant, um, and uh, he uh, generously donated it uh, to the Ogus collection. Now, in addition to... Uh, two-dimensional uh, artifacts, uh, those being photographs that I just showed you. Uh, you know, we have photographs of individuals, of uh, landscapes. These are all from the collection uh, of Mr. George Macritus. Um, these, are, these are his family members, actually, uh, who uh, lived in one of the largest communities of uh, immigrants from the uh, village of uh, Alatsata, the town of Alatsata, a coastal town. Uh, on the western coast of um, Asiatic uh, Turkey today. Uh, and it's about uh, 30, 40 minutes outside of uh, the city of Izmir uh, to the southwest. Um, so all of those immigrants en masse in the beginning of the 20th century, some, some 500 families migrated to the, the town, the suburb of uh, Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, in, a, in an area uh, known as Brick Bottom. And uh, those families lived there, you know, in, in that enclave uh, up until the uh, late 40s, mid 50s, um, uh, before the, uh, the town was uh, claimed by eminent domain and um, the, uh, the Boston Turnpike currently uh, runs over it, uh, unfortunately. Um, so these are, uh, again, photographs from his collection, uh, his parents, his grandparents, uh, uh, some of these photos are actually taken uh, in front of their home at Brick Bottom. Uh, so you can see here, for example, uh, this area back here, this neighborhood with uh, Mr. McCreese's uh, uh, grandfather and, and pictured here uh, of what Brick Bottom actually looked like uh, from their vantage point uh, in this, in this uh, enclave. Um, in addition to the photographs of individuals and places. There's also uh, you know, a collection of documents that I've already mentioned. This is another example I'd like to bring to your attention. 
Um, this is the uh, uh, meeting minutes of the Los Angeles branch of that mutual aid society that I mentioned earlier, uh, from uh, which was set up by uh, people from Marmara, um, the Sea of Marmara. Um, this particular uh, ledger holds all the minutes of that uh, association. Uh, it's written in, in, in Greek script. Um, there's actually three uh, ledgers in total, um, and there's all sorts of details about the organization's uh, activities in the early 20th century. They were set up in 1909, as you can see here, um, and uh, these ledgers are, are really a historical uh, uh, collection of their uh, of their activities in, in Los Angeles. Now, uh, I bring I brought these two examples up to your attention because um, both of these are both the photographs I showed you uh, and the ledgers are now part of the George Smathers Library's uh, digital collection. Uh, this is an ongoing project, like I said. So uh, there's over 50,000 individual images, um, including documents and photographs and two-dimensional objects um, that will ultimately be housed in this archive uh, and will be made available to researchers, academics uh, worldwide through the UF digital collection. Uh, so that is the status of the um, artifacts. We also have three-dimensional artifacts that we've collected, uh, again, donated graciously by our, by our uh, respondents. Uh, this example uh, of a flask was donated by Miss uh, Flora Tornidis' family um, from Canton, Ohio, who immigrated from Livara, Turkey, which is in northeastern uh, Turkey on the Black Sea coast. Uh, this is a flask that was brought by her grandfather to, um, to the United States, to Canton. Uh, and we have the equipment, we have the three-dimensional scanning equipment to um, make available for, res for uh, researchers, for our students, uh, really, uh, to be able to capture three-dimensional objects, um, you know, through this, the 3D scanning software that uh, we have available. Um, so that's another component of the project is three-dimensional objects. And there's, uh, currently, we have over 30 uh, freestanding 3, 3D objects uh, in the collection. Now, in addition, in addition to two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects uh, and our map uh, is the next thing I'd like to uh, uh, bring to your attention. So uh, as a part of my uh, master's research uh, at Southern Connecticut State University, I started to collect uh, immigrant records from the Ellis Island Foundation's online archive. And I, I uh, used this, in, this information to trace immigration from the former Ottoman Empire to the United States. Uh, and one of the ways that I'm making this information available beyond its public availability through the Foundation's website uh, is to map it, uh, to map the uh, entries. And what you see here is a sample of 100 uh, immigrants, immigrant entries from that uh, from that archive. Uh, the date range is between 1900 and uh, 1930, and uh, the the focus of the sample is on uh, immigrants that claimed either Greek or Turkish uh, nationality and or race. Uh, so what you could see here is a heat map reconstruction of their places of birth, of the immigrants' places of birth. And of course, uh, the brighter spots uh, represent uh, higher populations of immigrants coming from those uh, cities. So, it, you know, it makes sense that uh, there's a large population coming from Istanbul, for example, from Izmir, uh, as well as other coastal cities, and also in, in uh, the hinterland of uh, what is now Turkey. Um, but in this first phase, what I'm trying to do is uh, kind of get a sense for where the immigrants were born and ultimately where they ended up in the United States. Okay, so the other side of the Atlantic here, uh, this is uh, uh, the same data sample, just 100 uh, total for the time being. Uh, and, you know, this, this data gives us the ability now to kind of trace immigration to the US and see where these uh, immigrants uh, settled. Now, you know, one of the things that's in the historical record is for is and is well known in the historical record is that for the most part, you know, the immigrants from uh, Greece, from the former Ottoman Empire, ultimately settled in the Northeast, in the Midwest, uh, and in the Northwest. And because of this collection process, we're able to see, you know, other 
regions, other cities and towns that um, you know are not as well known. For example, in in you know Oklahoma, in the mid in the heartland of the U.S. as it's called, um, you know these are some of the cities that popped that popped up in our sample that um, were unexpe unexpected. But you know thanks to this this data set uh, uh, collected by the Ellis Island Foundation. Uh, and from their archive, uh, we're able to uh, trace that migration. Now, in the second phase of this project, uh, I'm hoping to move in two directions. One direction is to trace immigration, not only as a function of city of birth, but also as a port of uh, departure so that there is that that data is available uh, in the data set and also as a, a function of um, uh, last place of residence. Uh, those two variables are also available. So this map in phase two is going to include a lot, of, a lot more data points uh, throughout Europe um, because of those variables. Uh, the fact that some people were may have been born in a particular uh, city uh, in the former Ottoman Empire, but then ultimately migrated somewhere else. Um, you know, and and uh, before ultimately leaving uh, and citing their port of departure as a different city uh, in Europe. Um, and also part of the second phase is going to be an attempt <laughs> to take the information from these initial data points here. Uh, and I could just click on one for you so you can see what I mean. Um, you know, take, the, take this information and now try to use census records to try to trace migration from these initial settlement points uh, to other areas in the United States. Um, and we have some uh, evidence uh, from the time being from our interviews, uh, wherein you know, the, the uh, community here of uh, you know, immigrants from Alatata who settled in Somerville, ultimately migrated to uh, you know, Fort, Fort Worth, uh, Texas. And there's a large community uh, there. Um, and, you know, so far we haven't been able to uh, locate, you know, any on our um, uh, archive, at least not as part of this sample. Now, this is a small sample. Remember, there's only 100 uh, individuals. Uh, but um, currently the collection stands at uh, approximately 3,200 uh, individual records. And that is an ongoing uh, collection process as well. So it's, it's, it's going to stand to be expanded upon. And like I said, in phase two, we're going to try to see if we can uh, trace migration from these initial points of settlement to other parts of the United States. Some challenges included in that, you know, uh, has, they have to do with uh, name changes, uh, which were very common. Um, you know, so that could that could pose a potential challenge uh, in trying to make great trace migration in phase two. Um, but uh, that's that's the plan, at least, is to to utilize uh, census records beyond that this point. Um, now, uh, in addition to, you know, these different components, you know, the, the goal, overall goal of the project uh, is to raise awareness, certainly about uh, this immigrant group, uh, the Ottoman Greek immigrant group and, and their arrival to the United States, the places that they left from where they were born, and the circumstances under which uh, they immigrated, for sure, the push pull factors, as they're called. Um, you know, but also uh, in, a, in, a, in a different sense to provide a way to kind of compare to other immigrant groups, uh, you know, and to uh, sort of provide a comparison data point for, um, uh, for understanding the differences, the similarities uh, between the immigrant experiences of this particular group uh, to um, Latinx immigrants, uh, to African Americans, uh, to um, African immigrants uh, in, in the modern sense, in the contemporary sense to African immigrants, um, and uh, also to the experiences of, of Native Americans as well. Uh, not their immigrant experiences so much as, um, you know, the, their experiences in the United States. Uh, so the, the interviews provide that information uh, to, to researchers. Uh, they're able to, they would be able to draw comparison points, uh, you know, but things like uh, not only their migration, of course, um, you know, because it, it is an pertinent uh, comparison uh, for these other groups, uh, African Americans, Native Americans, uh, for instance, um, but, you know, it could uh, racial uh, I, um, experiences of racialization, 
you know, though that could be a comparison point uh, for other uh, for other groups in the United States and this particular uh, uh, group. Uh, so that's sort of the broader picture. You know, there's all kinds of information in the in the interviews uh, that could be used. There's all kinds of information in the um, Ellis Island Foundation uh, uh, data as well that could be used. And you know, primarily what we'd like to do is uh, make this information available to UF students. Uh, but beyond that, to researchers, like I said, worldwide, um, UF students could easily get involved with any part of this project. Um, you know, they could they could partake in the data collection and entry of uh, the Ellis Island Foundation archive data. Um, they could uh, learn the ins and outs of um, interview methodology, transcription, uh, you know, refinement of the tra of transcripts and production of, uh, of those materials uh, through different methods, uh, such as written academic work, um, of course, uh, or podcasts, short videos, uh, you know, all sorts of online presentation methods as well. Um, and what I'd like to close with uh, before taking your questions uh, is an example of such a presentation with the, with the help of the great folks at the Samuel Proctor Old History Program uh, I was able to produce a short podcast that utilizes this information, some of this information. Um, and what I'd like to do is uh, play you a, that podcast, which is uh, uh, titled uh, The Acropolis and the Madonna. And uh, this is a case study uh, of um, refugee deportation in the early 20th century from the United States back to Greece. So these, uh, these immigrants arrived uh, as refugees to the U.S., uh, and um, they they began their journey in Izmir, uh, in uh, contemporary Izmir, and ultimately um, found themselves at Ellis Island, um, as the podcast will explain, um, and then it'll also explain the circumstances under which they were uh, deported. So I'd like to play that uh, podcast for you now, uh, and then conclude. Back to Turkey. Though these refugees were in need of asylum, they were denied because of the xenophobic forces influencing EU policy. Public figures in the EU and the US are once again discriminating against refugees, and in the process transporting us through a time warp to the early 20th century. At that time, the dehumanization of refugees facilitated the ratification of immigration restrictions against them. My name is George Topolitis, and this is the Ottoman Greeks of the U.S. podcast series in the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. All interview clips used in this podcast series are with descendants of immigrants from the former Ottoman Empire. A hundred years ago, discriminatory public rhetoric resulted in the drafting of the most restrictive immigration legislation in U.S. history, the Immigration Restriction Act of 1921. The act's main provision established annual quotas based on a 3% immigrant admission rate per nationality. Lawmakers derived this figure using the number of U.S. residents country of origin as reported in the 1910 U.S. Census. When the quota was exhausted for a given year, any additional immigrants were deported to their country of origin. This legislation had detrimental effects on some of the most vulnerable targets of the time, 90 Armenian and Greek refugees from Smyrna. Smyrna was a wealthy port city on the western coast of Asia Minor. It hosted many western merchant companies and supported large trade networks within Asia Minor and beyond. In the spring of 1922, Smyrna's influential Greek inhabitants had every reason to be optimistic about their position in the city's future. The Greek army landed in the city on May 15th of 1919 and had since then successfully campaigned eastward to the outskirts of Ankara. The Turkish army, led by Mustafa Kemal, failed to curtail the Greek advance in the summer of 1920. The Ottoman Empire was on its last breath. Meanwhile, and according to the following testimony from a descendant of Zmirna refugees, life in Zmirna coasted along. When he was a kid, the Sultan was still there. And they would have in the cafe, you know, all the male people of the community spent their life in the cafe. And he said they had the heroes of 1821 up on the wall, you know, pictures. But whenever those soldiers are from the Sultan, they knew they were coming, they would pull those down and hide them and put the Sultan's picture up because they would come in and, you know, check and see what was going on. Yeah, I remember him telling me that story. 
And then once the soldiers were gone, they put the heroes back up again. When news spread of the Greek front's collapse in late August 1922, panic gripped the city's Greek and Armenian communities. On September 1st, the exhausted Greek soldiers entered the city by foot and in the process justified the panic of Izmir's inhabitants. By 10 p.m. on September 8th, the Greek governance of the city ended and the last Greek troops departed for Athens by September 19th. On September 9th, Mustafa Kemal, fresh from his victory over the Greek army two weeks prior, arrived in Zmyrna. He issued a warning that the Armenians and Greeks of the city should not be harmed. However, that warning was not effectively enforced. Four days later, the Armenian quarter of the city was the starting point of a fire that consumed it and all of the Greek quarter by September 16th. These events were catastrophic for the city's residents as attested by a descendant whose family experienced them firsthand. My great uncle, his wife, and his children, I think there were two of them at least, may have been more, I don't know, at least two, they were murdered. That was the word that was used by my great aunt. Um, I think they were marked off somewhere. And she, she used the word machine gun to death. And she, was supposed to be married actually the weekend after that happened they had set for the wedding but when that happened they killed the groom they burned the house that he had built of course the place burned down and along with it all of her pretty got all of her stuff that she had ready for the marriage and she barely escaped rape actually because only because she ran into the area of town where there were European people and a French family took her in off the streets. They were, the soldiers were after her and they took her in. And I guess they wouldn't mess with, you know, foreign people, European, French families and like that. They only mess with the Armenians and the Greeks. And so she told us about all of that. And then after it was over, she went and found her mother who had somehow escaped all of this slaughter and probably due to the foster son that they had taken in, it's in these pictures. And all of them together, I guess, went down to the waterfront and were able to get on a boat and go to Piraeus. Both Greeks in Greece and the Ottoman Empire alike recognized Myrna as the emblematic cosmopolitan city of Asia Minor. As is the case with the modern Syrian refugees, the nearby Aegean islands of Lesbos and Chios were initial stops for the Smyrna refugees before journeying to mainland Greece and other Western destinations, including the U.S. The journey for the Armenian and Greek refugees from Smyrna was arduous and long. This was due to the cold power ship engine technology of the time, as well as the quarantine hold times at refugee camps in Constantinople, Thessaloniki, Piraeus, and Patras. The refugees left Piraeus aboard the SS Acropolis on November 2nd, 1922, for the island of Syros. After making port, the ship proceeded to Patras and arrived there on November 10th. At Patras, 200 refugees from Constantinople were urged aboard. Horace Stiles, the U.S. consul in Patras, warned the Greek authorities that the immigration quota pertaining to Armenians and Greeks for that year had already expired. The ship spent 34 days docked in Patras due to a crew strike and lack of provisions for the journey. Finally, on December 13th, the ship set out for Valletta, Malta with the refugees from Smyrna on board. The fuel was entirely consumed during the journey to Malta and the crew started to burn wood from the ship itself for additional fuel. The Acropolis reached Malta on December 18th and stocked up on coal and provisions. While there, the ship's captain deserted and the ship's crew continued the journey to New York. The Acropolis made two more mandatory stops for fuel in Algiers and the Azores. During this journey, two babies were born on board. According to a New York Times article, the Acropolis reached New York Harbor four days later, but Quote, immigration officials refused to permit any of the immigrants to land until the federal authorities in Washington had ruled on the cases of Greeks, Armenians, and others whose quotas had been exhausted, unquote. 
Ellis Island doctors and clerks were the first officials that the refugees encountered upon their arrival to Ellis Island. These agents documented immigrant arrivals, screened them for diseases, and determined if they would be admitted, quarantined, or deported using a rudimentary process. They were checked as they were leaving the boat, and there was somebody with a piece of chart that wrote something on their clothing that indicated, you know, a limp, cockeyed, or whatever the symptoms the person looked like they had. So they were taken aside and given more attention to whether they were going to let them in. There was somebody who got sent back three times for whatever reason, and the fourth time was the child. <laughs> Seven refugees were hospitalized, and one of the seven, Ankino Ashakian, passed away in Ellis Island's infirmary. The refugees were facing deportation to Piraeus due to the Greek officials embarking them despite the consul's warning. It was at this juncture that a New York City-based attorney, Malcolm Vartan Malcolm, became involved. I'm a Harvard grad, class of 1913. In 1916, I moved to New York City and resided at 2 Rector Street. In 1919, I authored a book entitled The Armenians in America. And five years later, I testified in a case challenging the legal obstacles that Armenians encountered in attaining US citizenship. Originally an immigrant from Sivas, Turkey, myself, I became the Smyrna refugee's primary advocate to the press. You could say that I'm somewhat of an advocate for Armenian immigrant rights. Malcolm evoked the literacy exception of the Immigration Act of 1917 for religious refugees in order to acquire a writ of habeas corpus. Federal Judge Learned Hand was responsible for issuing the writ. Hand was born in Albany, New York, and graduated from Harvard in 1896. He moved to New York City in December of 1902 and married Franz Frink. His wife was a well-known Philhellene and may have impacted Judge Leonard's disposition toward the Smyrna refugees. When they arrived at Ellis Island, Hand was the presiding federal judge in New York City. He granted a writ of habeas corpus to Malcolm, and thereby a stay of the refugees' deportation order and a hearing of their case. His action was standard legal procedure, but it also challenged the authority of Ellis Island agents. The writ only applied to 51 Armenian refugees on the Acropolis. However, the reportage contested the timeliness of the writ's delivery to Ellis Island Commissioner Robert E. Todd. According to Todd, the ship was already underway when he received the writ. Malcolm insisted that the writ was served to the commissioner at 5.30 p.m. prior to the ship's departure, and not at 6 p.m. when the ship was already en route. Additionally, an official on the ship offered to stop it and allow the Armenians to disembark, but Todd refused. In Malcolm's own words, after obtaining the writ of habeas corpus from Judge Han, which would have enabled the Armenians to obtain consideration as persons persecuted for their religion, which they are, I telephoned to Ellis Island to announce the fact and to arrange to put the men, women, and children off the ship. I couldn't get the commissioner at first, but talked to a Mr. Landis, who refused to listen to the suggestion that he should confirm the issuance of the writ and take the people off the ship. Malcolm relayed Todd's statements to the press and exposed him as a nativist ideologue. It was too late to get over to Ellis Island with the writ, so I went to the battery with Mr. Jones, an official of the Faber Line, who had two tugs ready to go down the bay and take off the persons named in the writ. Mr. Todd came on a late boat. I served the writ on him. He was extremely angry. He said no such writ had ever been served on him before. He said the Armenians were a dirty lot and that he did nothing for them. Mr. Todd repeated that they were in excess of their quota and that he would not give the authority to do this, writ or no writ. In the same newspaper article, Todd defended his decision and rejected Malcolm's accusation. Oh, we can't pay any attention to telephone communications. We don't know anything about where they're coming from. The fact of the matter is that the writ was not served until it was too late to act on it. The United States District Attorney has ruled that we are not to interfere with ships that have started on their way. If we interfered in this case, the ship would have been held up for hours. How could we know whether we were getting the right ones? In regards to the charge that he referred to the Armenians as, quote, a dirty law, unquote, he replied, I used no such language and said nothing that reflected on them in any way. 
In his defense, the publication of such a charge may have tarnished Todd's reputation. Although the exact cause is unknown, Henry Kern relieved Todd of his post later that year. The Acropolis's journey ended with its transfer of the Smyrna refugees to New York. This was the ship's final voyage by that name. The Boris Shipping Company purchased it at some point prior to April 28, 1923. We named it as the SS Washington. The SS Madonna, belonging to the Faber shipping line, transported the Smyrna refugees back to Piraeus, Greece on February 9, 1923. The Smyrna refugees and modern Syrian refugees' experiences have a lot in common. Both were expelled from their native lands, which were obliterated. They both followed the same escape routes to the U.S. And the same xenophobia endured by the Smyrna refugees is now an obstacle for the Syrian refugees' path to asylum. In the winter of 1923, that xenophobia resulted in the deportation of the Smyrna refugees back to Greece. The legal options and technological tools available to U.S. officials today can and should facilitate a better outcome than deportation of Syrian refugees. Okay, uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude uh, the presentation of different components of the Ottoman Greeks of the U.S. project and take any questions you have. Thank you for your time. Okay, um, we have a number of questions that have come in. <clears throat> Some of them have come through the Q&A window. A number of them have been sent via chat. Chris, can you uh, work on those from the Q&A and then yeah. we can respond to those in the chat window as well? Sure. So um, I want to thank you, George, for the wonderful uh, presentation. It was really fascinating. And uh, I have a few questions myself, but um, we have a question from uh, Violetta. Uh, I'm going to skip the question of Remy because, uh, or do you want me to, uh, Amy, do you want me to do that first? Uh, that was in the chat room. Um, let, let me let me do that. Okay. First. Um, so Remy, she's asking, um, George, uh, she's asking what has been the process of integration after the early phase of uh, migration? Uh, for instance, if we know uh, whom did they marry, uh, if they got uh, married within the home community or uh, other Greeks or uh, non-Greeks, uh, that's a question. Um, and I have actually a similar question of my own, so I don't know if you want to address both. I was wondering what was, if there is any information about the relationship between those immigrants from the Ottoman uh, Empire and the Greeks from mainland Greece. Because I know that when some of these immigrants moved to Greece, they became marginalized, they, beca they became uh, segregated. So I was wondering if there was a similar attitude by those Greeks who were coming from mainland Greece. And uh, I think this is kind of similar to what uh, Reni uh, is asking. Those are, those are great questions. Um, uh, thank you, Renee Hershon. Actually, Renee Hershon uh, is a, a great mentor of mine. I look up to her work. Um, uh, she is a, a well-known author in this in this area, and uh, her, her work on um, refugees in Greece actually was part of the impetus for me to pursue this this uh, research after reading her book, um, Heirs of the Greek Catastrophe. Uh, so I, I'm really honored that she's here and she's asking me a question. Um, I'd like to say that in response that um, the different ty types of data that we've collected um, uh, show that there is uh, integration uh, between the incoming immigrants from the former Ottoman Empire uh, within their communities uh, to some degree. So uh, on two levels, one level is through marriage, yes, you know, there, there is intermarriage between um, auto, former immigrants, Ottoman Greek immigrants and um, immigrants from Greece, from mainland Greece, uh, and also uh, between Ottoman Greek immigrants and um, not Americans, non-Greeks, other ethnicities uh, in the United States. We see that definitely. Um, and that's through the, the uh, interviews. We also see it in the uh, Ellis Island archive data. 
uh, one of the variables is marriage. Uh, and uh, quite often, uh, you know, this is, this is analysis that I still have to do. I'm doing this for my dissertation. Uh, but quite often uh, in that data, we see, you know, the, the, fa the whole family um, immigrating to the United States. So there's indication, there's evidence there of, you know, uh, couples and their families uh, married, uh, you know, in, in, um, in Greece in some cases, uh, depending on what the, the port of departure is that can be inferred that it's in Greece or in the former Ottoman Empire um, and arriving into the United States and then that information being documented on the ship's manifest. So those are the two areas. Um, now, um, we also have evidence of, uh, you know, there being uh, some prejudice uh, between uh, Greeks from Greece and Greeks, uh, you know, Ottoman Greeks, as well as Greeks who were, you know, living, residing in the former Ottoman Empire. Um, that, that we found as well. Um, and that, that's mostly coming from our interviews. Uh, and there is some evidence in the newspaper, um, uh, you know, archives as well that, um, again, all of this I'm, I'm sifting through at the moment and uh, preparing it for my dissertation. Um, so uh, on, on those two levels, we see some integration and there's also some resistance. Um, so I hope I um, answered both questions. <laughs> Yes, great. Uh, the next question, actually, Violetta has two questions. So if I may present both to you, and maybe you can address both of these questions. The first question uh, is, uh, are the oral histories structured? Uh, is there a questionnaire? And the second question is uh, how you deal in terms of analysis with the fact that these are secondhand information, uh, meaning that these, uh, these people uh, talk about the experiences of their parents and grandparents, but not the experiences of their own. These are both great questions. So the, um, you know, to kind of answer the first question, yes, um, there is a questionnaire. Um, and I, I kind of alluded to the, uh, to the structure of the questionnaire earlier when I talked about the interviews, you know, the, the, it's broken down into their experiences uh, in the former Ottoman Empire, um, the ancestors' experiences in the former Ottoman Empire, um, and then uh, their migration stories about their, their migration, immigration, expulsion uh, in some cases. So uh, that is a component of the questionnaire. And then uh, ultimately their experiences arriving in the United States. Um, you yeah, know, that's also there. And there, and um, there's different sections that are dedicated to uh, cultural components as well, such as, um, you know, music and languages spoken and uh, food and uh, recognition of, uh, you know, musical instruments and also of um, uh, different word association uh, uh, tools uh, in, in the questionnaire. Um, there's questions about their church communities as well, Greek schools uh, that they participated in, um, and uh, questions about marriage and intermarriage. Uh, all, uh, all of those are in the questionnaire. Um, and, I, and the second question was regarding um, you know, dealing with the fact that they're, that they're discussing uh, their ancestors' uh, recollection. So, you know, this is... Uh, this is part of my dissertation. This is one of one of the, one of the um, theories that I'm going to try to apply here is uh, social memory theory and uh, specifically a transgenerational transfer of uh, of um, identity, memories of identity, memories of trauma, uh, as well. This is all in you know existing scholarship. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of hoping to make a, a contribution to that scholarship and uh, complement uh, what already exists in that regard. Okay. Uh, an anonymous uh, attendee um, writes uh, that when uh, when you go to the collections website and and, and I'm not going to read the address, but I guess you're familiar with the uh, address. He only sees or she only sees uh, two items, and uh, the question is: Are there more than two? That's a great question. Yeah. So um, the website only has like two samples. Uh, at the moment uh, for two-dimensional objects uh, and uh, links to um, an outside and external website for three-dimensional objects. Um, but uh, ultimately everything will live here uh, at this address. This is the archive. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, um, 
I'll quickly back up here and put this in the in the chat so everyone can access it. Um, this is the UF uh, Digital Collections uh, uh, platform for the Ottoman Greeks of the United States project. Uh, ultimately, all of the artifacts are going to upload, be uploaded here and be made available to researchers um, for, the, for their own use, for, their, for, the, for research purposes. Um, so yeah, for the time, for the time being, all to, all, you know, the, the website will only have those examples, but it will link, it, it links already here. Um, and as more and more of these artifacts are made available, uh, this is the place to find them. It's, it's uh, at the UF uh, DC, the Un University of Florida Libraries Digital Collection. Uh, the next question is from uh, Panos, who is asking um, if these maps are publicly available and also if you've looked into uh, migrant routes to other continents such as Africa and Oceania, and uh, if there is any uh, time parameter in the maps. Um, this is a great question. Uh, so the, the only map that's currently publicly available is the one that um, I presented here. Um, so this is a work in progress as well, and I'll post it to the chat. Um, so everyone has the link. It, it, the, in regards to you know, other migrant routes to other continents, uh, that's a limitation of the of the sample. Um, so, uh, what what's available in the Ellis Island uh, archive collection, uh, you know, mostly for, mostly pertains to immigration to the United States to Ellis Island specifically. Um, there are there is data. There's some data, scant data, uh, for people who are in transit, and I'm recording that as well. I'm recording I'm recording people who are in transit uh, through. Ellis Island to uh, other regions of the world that does that does happen, but it's not the primary um, fo uh, focus of the data, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then as far as time parameter is concerned, if I understand that question correctly, um, yes, the, the, the book sort of the, the chronological bookends are 1900 to 1930. And this, this was, you know, the, this range was uh, purposefully selected uh, because this is the this is the time period when um, you know the majority of immigrants from this part of the world uh, entered the United States. Uh, the next two questions I will read them again together because I think they relate to each other. One is from uh, Eileen and the other is from an anonymous uh, attendee. So the question is, how can undergrads get involved in this project? And how do you go about finding uh, participants for the project? Uh, do you reach directly um, people in Greek cultural festivals or other events? Or how do you go by finding uh, participants in the project? So to answer Eileen's question, email me. <laughs> uh, that's basically how you get involved in the project. Um, you know, if, you're, if you're a UF student, um, just send me an email and uh, we'll take it from there. Um, uh, as far as uh, recruitment of um, individuals interested in, in uh, donating, participating uh, in the project, um, primarily through uh, what's known as snowball sampling uh, in, uh, in this sociological lingo. You know, we, what I focus on is identifying uh, you know, key individuals uh, in particular communities, um, you know, spending time with them, talking to them, um, kind of informing them, you know, what the project is all about and what the goals of the project ultimately, ultimately are. And then sometimes they end up participating, being, being uh, interviewed themselves um, and uh, certainly providing other individuals who they know of, um, you know, that fit the profile of the descendant that um, this project uh, tries to, to um, 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 collect information uh, from. And, um, you know, the one tool I think I could sort of, uh, you know, highlight here is Facebook and social media. Um, I, through, through the project's website, um, Facebook page, which I'll, uh, I'll put here for everyone um, to access. Uh, you know, this 
uh, this web, this uh, Facebook page allows us to to periodically um, share posts about you know recruit, recruitment, people being interested to be interviewed if they wish to be interviewed to contact us. Um, and ultimately, we have now uh, recently, thanks to the wonderful work of Class IT, the folks at Class IT, uh, we have a web page that is dedicated to. Um, scheduling of interviews. So I'll put that also here. Um, and that's, those are the, those are the tools um, really is through, through this snowball sampling uh, method. Uh, there are three uh, questions, which again, I think they're kind of similar uh, by George, James and uh, Gail. And uh, George is asking, um, his uh, grandparents were originally from uh, Smyrna, uh, migrated to Greece, and then uh, he had grandparents or parents uh, that came to the United States. And uh, George is asking how would uh, would be able to track them down. Uh, James uh, has a similar question. He also talks about uh, his mother's family. Um, who travel uh, from Istanbul to Thessaloniki, and they purchased uh, they purchase a house there, which um, they realize later on, if I understand correctly, uh, that that was the birthplace uh, of Kemal, um, and later was uh, converted to be uh, the Turkish embassy, and uh, James is asking. Uh, information on dates and uh, occupancy. And finally, uh, Gail, she's asking a similar question. Um, her grandpa escaped Smyrna, uh, went to Thessaloniki, and then they settled in uh, Massachusetts. And um, how can she find more information about his life in Asia Minor, and if you have any suggestions, uh, those are all great questions. Uh, uh, from um, the U the United States vantage point, and finding information from in, in the U.S., um, you know, uh, I could suggest some. I don't know if uh, the participants, uh, you know, are are um, no have already accessed these sites that they may have and not found anything, but. Um, you know, certainly the Ellis Island uh, archive, online archive, I'll um, post that uh, here for them. Um, that's one place to look. Um, and in addition, Ancestry, I mean, Ancestry or Heritage.org, uh, these are good uh, genealogical uh, resources to access. I use them myself uh, for my own research uh, quite often. Um, so, um, you know, those, those are certainly uh, good places to look. As far as records are concerned, um, in the former Ottoman Empire, um, you know, right at the moment, uh, at least as of my most recent attempt uh, to access um, the Ottoman archives, which were, which was like a couple of years ago, um, you know, there, there was a, a, a couple of, there was like a restriction placed at the time. I'm not sure if it still uh, exists, um, but there was a restriction placed on Ottoman, on, um, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Ottoman, uh, on, I have Ottoman in my mind, uh, on Turkish uh, citizens uh, only. Uh, so you would have to actually have like a, uh, um, a number related to your uh, citizenship status. Uh, the term escapes me at the moment, but that's the only way you could actually access the records. But like I said, those were, that was a couple of years back. Uh, the Ottoman archives are definitely a good place to go uh, if you have access to them as well, and you're trying to look for information, um, you know, in in uh, in Turkey. Um, uh, of course, all of the uh, that information is going to require some knowledge of the language, uh, which, you know, um, in some cases is is uh, contemporary Turkish, modern Turkish, and in other cases it's Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman script. Uh, so it might help, it might be helpful to, to uh, locate, you know, individuals, genealogists, people who work with, with these materials um, and um, sort of, you know, um, defer that, that research to them. Uh, that would be my, my uh, recommendation.
So I believe these are all the questions we have uh, from the Q&A. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that is all we have. But we have a few questions from the uh, chat. And uh, Amy, you, you said that you would take care of those. There have been a number of requests about whether or not you're still taking the oral histories, but you did post the link into the uh, into the chat window. So if people want to copy it from there, they can. In addition, when we post the recording for this on the CES website, we will post additional information and links. So we'll post links to the website where the information is stored. We can also post George's contact information and information on how to um, schedule a, an interview or find further information on that. So I think that most people did move their comments and questions um, into the chat window. And since we're actually officially four minutes over time, um, I think we are happily uh, having discussed with everyone all of their questions. So I very much want to thank George for what was clearly a very interesting presentation and congratulate him on this rather epic prog uh, project that he has embarked on, which as an advanced graduate student is, is all the more impressive. Um, and again, we will send an email out to all the people who were registered on this talk, letting them know when the recording has been posted so that you can also easily find all of the additional information if for any reason you were unable to copy it from the chat window. And please do complete that survey on your way out. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Uh, really appreciate Great. it.